My name is Dr. Joseph Duraney, and I am the Chair of Cardiovascular Surgery at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, um, with an area of expertise in pediatric and adult congenital heart disease. Today's video is going to focus on adult congenital heart disease, what the patient and family should know and ask. As background, there are more adults with congenital heart disease now in North America than there are children. This is in large part due to successful correction and repair of many defects, most often repaired in infancy and some in childhood in the current era. Some operations for some procedures have a low probability of needing reoperation, and some have a high probability, and some have a certain probability of needing a reoperation down the road. The first important point to make is who should be taking care of these patients? The importance of a multidisciplinary team who have had formal training in congenital heart disease is the backbone of successful care with this group of patients. This is not a group of patients for casual care by an adult cardiovascular surgeon or an adult cardiologist who does not have knowledge or expertise of all of the nuances that come with congenital heart disease. Where they are cared for will vary from program to program and city to city or region to region. Some adults may be cared for in a children's hospital, some in an adult hospital. But the bottom line is, is that the integrated team needs to be by personnel who have training in congenital heart disease. So the practitioners go to the location where the patient is. Now, risk of operation is determined by many variables. But the most important variable is surgical expertise and training in congenital heart disease. And to a lesser extent, but equally important, the other practitioners. When patients are cared for in an environment by personnel trained in congenital heart disease, risk of surgery is low. Ventricular function also plays a major factor in determining outcome. And as we get older, that is the adult population, the, the addition of other comorbid conditions like diabetes, high blood pressure, et cetera, all of this will also contribute to outcome related to intervention. In addition, risk increases with the increasing number of prior operations. And it is not uncommon for some adult patients to have a fourth, fifth, or sixth, or seventh operation. The greater the number of previous sternotomies, particularly when there have been four or five in the past, the risk of operation starts to escalate considerably. Blood transfusion is an important point to bring out here. When a surgeon or a practitioner is confronted with an adult patient with congenital heart disease, many variables cannot be controlled for or dealt with by the physician. For example, I can't control whether somebody has diabetes, and I can't control whether somebody has hypertension, and I can't control whether somebody's had five previous operations. But I can control whether blood products are administered in the perioperative period. And the use of blood transfusions in the perioperative period highly determines outcome. Types of operation can vary in the adult population. The vast majority are reoperations, which we have referred to just recently, but there also can be some first-time operations for congenital heart disease, which haven't been identified until the adult years. And interestingly enough, there are many diagnoses which may not become apparent until the adult years, albeit relatively uncommon in the developed world where many of us have access to good medical care. Interestingly, most of the problems related to congenital heart defects in the adult population are valve-related, and many of the procedures involve more than one valve. The options are going to range from repair to replacement, and of course, repair is going to be preferred. When replacement is necessary, there are going to be a variety of options, ranging from mechanical valves to discs that open and close to tissue valves that may come from an animal or come from another human. And in the current era, there is a considerable amount of research going on with tissue engineering so that patients could theoretically have their own valve grown in advance 
be, uh, so that an operation can be planned down the road. Now, in general, repair is preferred. This is going to be highly determined by surgeon experience. You need to ask your surgeon how many he or she has done because the probability of successful repair is directly related to surgeon experience. When a valve needs to be replaced, there are many decisions that go into the selection of a given prosthesis. How long will it last? How long it lasts is in large part determined by the age of the patient. The younger the patient, the quicker many of these tissue valves wear out. The older the patient, the longer lasting the same tissue valve will be. The number of prior operations. As the risk goes up with uh, the greater the number of previous operations, greater consideration would be given to a mechanical valve with the hope that we might be halting, at least for a more extended period of time, the number of interventions needed. Lifestyle plays a role. If it's a young woman who might be considering pregnancy and family planning, mechanical valves would be a poor choice because the anticoagulant medicines that are required are generally not ideal and would be preferred to be avoided during the course of pregnancy. It may be a man who has a job of physical labor where their body is, is often exposed to potential trauma. Anticoagulants, again, would prefer to be avoided. In contrast to someone who might have an office job where the chances of bodily trauma is quite minimized, anticoagulants may be a reasonable alternative. Importantly, the use of anticoagulants has received a lot of bad press in recent years because of bleeding problems, but I would emphasize that in the current era, the monitoring techniques for these medicines has gotten quite sophisticated. Actually, patients themselves, themselves help monitor their blood thinning status, much like a diabetic would monitor their own blood sugars. This greatly reduces the risks related to anticoagulant medicines. Finally, newer anticoagulant medicines are going to become available in the next five to seven years, and the monitoring and the dosing will be quite simplified. Late complications and surveillance are essential with any patient with congenital heart disease. Arrhythmias are the most common late complication, always being looked after with appropriate testing to see when they are going to become apparent so that appropriate medical therapy or interventional therapy can be advised. Recurrent or residual lesions also may be present in the background. All of this emphasizes the point of experienced personnel, in this case, experienced adult congenital cardiologists looking after these patients so that the problems get identified, the appropriate treatment gets implemented, and importantly, it gets implemented in a timely fashion. Mayo Clinic Rochester has the largest experience in the world in the management of adults with congenital heart disease. All of the personnel involved are formally trained in congenital heart disease, and we have management protocols that determine when echoes, when MRs, when CTs, when lab tests, all of the testing that should be done, we have in a organized manner so that patients know exactly what is going on and we can optimize the timing of interventions so that the risk of any procedure is as low as possible and the late results are optimized. If there are any individuals that have questions or inquiries about a particular problem related to this matter, you can contact us for a review of outside information and we would be happy to see you in consultation uh, to make appropriate recommendations to ensure that you are on the right path for a good, healthy, happy, long-term outcome. Thanks very much for listening.